Hi, welcome to Tradition Today. I'm your host, Father David Smith. Today we continue with part four of a four-part series on the Jesus Prayer. We've already looked at the biblical foundation and history of the prayer, the various parts of the prayer itself and what the prayer is not. We've looked at some of the Orthodox writings on the Jesus Prayer and hesychasm, which means stillness. It's a way of describing the practice of the Jesus Prayer. In this part, we're going to look at the context of the prayer. It's context in the church, in our culture, and in our individual lives. I begin with the prayer in the context of the church because this is often the mushy part of the foundation that topples hesychasm in believers. That's a strange illustration. Nevertheless, I've spoken about the Jesus Prayer as it has appeared in some recent novels. And in those cases, the person practicing the Jesus Prayer is not a part of the church. On the other hand, we see that in the book, The Way of a Pilgrim, that the pilgrim often attends services in the churches he encounters in his journey, and he encourages others to do so. He is successful as a hesychast, and the others are unsuccessful. Now, do I attribute his success in practicing the Jesus prayer to his constant desire to attend the services in the church? Absolutely I am. You can say the prayer with every breath you take from now till the day you die. And if you're not a part of the church, your effort will yield little or no spiritual benefit. In our last program, we looked at some of the great writings on the practice of hesychasm and the name Saint Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain figured prominently as the editor of both the Philokalia and the Evergetinos. He was also the editor of another work composed by a single writer, a Catholic priest of the 16th century whose name was Lorenzo Scupoli, a work entitled Unseen Warfare. Saint Nicholas translated from the Italian, obviously, and added to Scupoli's work and then some years later, St. Theophan the Recluse, who is the Russian translator of the Philokalia, did the same thing to Nicodemus's work. He translated it, but he made many more changes to the text than even uh, uh, St. Nicodemus did. It's from this Russian edition, a translation and revision of a translation and a revision of the original text, that the English version we have uh, today is available to us. Nevertheless, this is a very useful book for those who are serious about the spiritual life. It's somewhat like the Evergetinos in that it doesn't only address the practice of hesychasm, but the spiritual life in general. It has sections that focus in particular on the Jesus prayer and Really, I can sum up those sections with a quotation from uh, page 214, quote, I advise you to acquire the habit of it, unquote. But Unseen Warfare also makes it clear that we must pursue hesychasm and indeed all spiritual effort in the context of the church, quote, after a man has decided to abandon his wrong ways and actually does abandon them, the first task of the enemy is to clear a space for an unhampered field of action against him. He succeeds in this by suggesting to a man who has entered the right path that she, he should act on his own advice and, and guidance and not go for advice and guidance to the teachers of the righteous life who are always attached to the church." Unquote. Here we see that there is a personality behind the tendency for us to form our spirituality outside the church, and that personality is the devil. 
He knows that he can make you fail in your attempts to grow in your Christian faith if he can keep you away from the church, from the doctrine, from the instruction, from the fellowship, from the sacraments of the church. In the Philokalia, the sacraments are presumed because the work was originally meant for monastics, and of course they would be a part of the church and the ongoing liturgical life of the monastery. But there are parts that give us a glimpse into the importance of pursuing hesychasm in the context of the church, as in this quote from St. Gregory of Sinai. Quote, Prior to the enjoyment of the blessings that transcend the intellect, and as a foretaste of that enjoyment, the noetic activity of the intellect mystically offers up the Lamb of God upon the altar of the soul and partakes of him in communion. To eat the Lamb of God upon the soul's noetic altar is not simply to apprehend him spiritually or to participate in him. It is also to become an image of the Lamb as he is in the age to come. Now we experience the manifest expression of the mysteries. Hereafter, we hope to enjoy their very substance. This is in the fourth volume of the Philokalia. This does not mean that we are to think of the Jesus prayer as a sort of mystical substitute for communion. When St. Gregory says, now we experience the manifest expression of the mysteries, he's speaking of the actual participation in the body and blood of Jesus Christ in the divine liturgy. In preparation for the time when we will enjoy their very substance. The very substance does not happen in this world. At every divine liturgy, just before he walks out of the altar with the holy gifts in order to commune the faithful, the priest says this, O Christ, great and most holy Pascha, wisdom, word, and power of God, grant that we may more perfectly partake of thee in the never-ending day of thy kingdom, unquote. St. Gregory was saying the same thing. In this life, we partake of the manifest expression of the mysteries, and this prepares us by molding us into an image of the Lamb as he is in the age to come, where we will partake of the very substance. The Jesus prayer must be practiced in the context of the church. It may seem like the opposite is true. We might think that we can just say the short prayer over and over and over again and, and wait for the transcendence to set in. But that's not what happens. And on the other side, it also might seem like standing in church has nothing to do with the Jesus prayer. It's difficult to pray when the, when the choir is off key or the person standing next to you is doused in Walmart perfume, or some child is crying, or your feet hurt. But it's critical that you're there. It may seem impossible to find a spiritual father who understands your interest in and your love for the prayer. But brothers and sisters, there is no other way. When you submit yourself to the doctrine, the instruction, the fellowship, the sacraments of the church, you will learn to submit to the will of God. That's where you find inner stillness and peace. When you avoid the church, stillness and peace fall out of your reach, no matter how much it might seem like the opposite is true. When you stand in judgment of the church and the people in the church, you cut off your ability to submit to the will of God. And the culture. How does the Jesus prayer fit into the context of our culture? It certainly seems like everything around us mitigates against the practice of the Jesus prayer. The repetition, 
the mindfulness, the submission to God. How often have I heard uh, people say when I mention the practice of the Jesus prayer, uh, how often have I heard them say something like, it sounds boring or it is boring. It's popular to want God to be entertainment for us. Spirituality for many people is something that should not be difficult, should not seem like work. It should be fun. Historically, the American experience of church focuses on preaching, not on liturgy. And the best preaching is creative, entertaining. It makes us think, and at its best, it fills us with emotion. We feel like the music should fill us with emotion. Even the announcements, at least they should contain a little bit of humor. I believe this to be the most critical issue facing the church today. If the church, and by extension the love of God, exists only for the purpose of entertaining us, it will find itself overwhelmed and drowned by all the other entertainments that this culture offers. The church is not good entertainment. I've gone to sporting events, concerts, movies, and even the most boring of those things is more entertaining than going to church. This is the reason I wrote the book, Help, I'm Bored in Church. I think that many of us automatically fall into the trap of going to church to be entertained and will find in time that it's not working. Some people simply stop going and others keep going but really don't know why. Yeah. But you're neither one of those. If you were, you wouldn't be watching this video right now. So what's the answer? It's address boredom. Examine it. Defeat it. I talk about how to do that in the book and it's not the subject of this program. But guess what? Boredom is a very real part of learning to say the Jesus prayer because we've been trained to consider certain experiences as boring in our culture. And the Jesus prayer fits precisely as one of those experiences. It's repetitive. It's hard work. It, the benefits are not immediate. It draws you away from sin. It focuses your mind. It doesn't need you, but you need it. I've had the experience of introducing groups to the Jesus prayer, and I like to have them try praying the prayer as a group for five minutes. Everyone agrees, if it's their first time with the Jesus prayer, that it feels like an eternity. The mind stays with the prayer for a minute, um, a minute or so, and then it wanders off to something else. Then it comes back and wonders if the priest is done praying the prayer yet, but he's not. So it wanders off into some entirely different distraction. Some people even get angry, and this indeed is a byproduct of boredom. We live in a culture that likes to hear about the Jesus prayer because it's interesting, but practicing it, not so much. So this brings up the question, why do it? Are we just keeping alive an interesting old practice from times past, from cultures not our own? What does the Jesus prayer offer in the context of our individual lives? I've had people tell me that the prayer is useless because it doesn't try to make anything better for anyone. It doesn't ask for anything. It doesn't uh, help anyone, they assert, to simply uh, have one person ask over and over to get the mercy of God. In answer, I, looked, I like to look at the prayer our Lord gave his disciples, the one we call the Lord's Prayer. What do we ask for in that prayer? I'm going to quote from St. Matthew's Gospels, chapter 6. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one." Unquote. <clears throat> now it sounds like there are four petitions in this prayer. Give us our daily bread, forgive us our debts, do not lead us into temptation, and deliver us from the evil one. But let's look at a couple of them. In the first petition, this is what we're asking God to give us in the original language of the New Testament. Ton arton epiusion. Now the word arton is easy because it means bread. But epiusion does not mean daily, not even close. The suffix epi indicates above, like epidermis is on, it's on you, it's above, it's above your bones, so to speak. And usion simply refers to being, it's a word of being. So consequently, the word epiusion is translated most literally as above being. So that what we request in the Lord's Prayer is that he would give us today the bread that is above being. What does that mean? Well, I know that it does not mean we're asking God to give us the things we need for today, which is the way we most often hear it interpreted. The word epiusion tells us that we're not asking for things, but for an on -day, uh, ongoing daily communion with God. Let's look at the next pet petition in the Lord's Prayer, where we ask God to forgive our trespasses. This is the way it sounds in the original. Ke afesimin to ophilimetaimon, os ke mis afikamentis ophiletesimon. Now the words that I want to look at are the two verbs, afes and its cousin afikamen. The English word forgive is a bit of a stretch here. The Greek word afimi literally means to lay aside or to leave behind. It's the word St. Peter used when he said to Jesus, we have left all and followed you. In the Lord's Prayer, forgive makes some sense since we lay aside the wrongs a person has done for us when we forgive, but it's a different matter to say lay aside our debts as we lay aside those of our debtors. In the English, the emphasis is on the word forgive. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But the Greek flows a little more poetically, and the repeated words express something more like lay aside the sins, lay aside our sins the way we lay aside others' sins. It's the reason that King James Version uh, uses the word debts and debtors, which really doesn't make any sense. I, I do want God to forgive my debts. I don't know that he's lent me anything with the expe expectation of a repayment. That doesn't make sense. But also there are people that I have lent money to, and I'm not necessarily going to tell them that I'm not expecting to receive the money back. For instance, when you make a deposit at the bank, you're essentially, or like a, 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 um, a credit union, you're, you're, you're really lending money and you expect to receive it back. You're not going to say, Lord, only forgive my sins if I tell the bank to keep my money and not give it back to me. You see, so, so but debt and debtors works in terms of keeping the sort of flow the original poetry of the sentence. Otherwise, you get something like, lay aside our sins the way we lay aside our sinners. That doesn't make sense either. My point is this. 
we're, I don't think we're asking for something here. I think the Lord's Prayer is itself a vehicle for maintaining a close relationship with God. It's the same thing as the Jesus Prayer. We don't ask God for anything because a relationship with God is all we want, is all we need. Achieving that is not only the most that we can ask for, but it's also all we need from God. I want to read you a quote from another great work of the spiritual life, The Ascetical Homilies of St. Isaac the Syrian. This book stands right next to the Philokalia as one of the great works of early Christianity, and it's well worth the effort it takes to read and understand it. St. Isaac says, quote, Those upon whom the light of faith has dawned are no longer so audacious as to pray for themselves, nor do they entreat God saying, Give this to us or take that from us, nor do they say in any wise, Take care of themselves. For at every moment, with the noetic eyes of faith, they see the fatherly providence which comes of the true Father to shelter them. He who in his great and immeasurable love surpasses all in paternal affection and who more than all has the power and might to help us exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think or conceive." Unquote. I myself, when I pray, I take time to ask God for things for myself and for others. It's a natural human tendency. But I spend the bulk of my time praying the Jesus prayer, hoping that one day I will achieve the heights of spiritual attainment and that would make the asking of requests unnecessary. Well, I hope the offering of these videos on the Jesus Prayer, coming from a sinner and an unprayerful person such as myself, will nevertheless help you in your spiritual journey. God bless you.